As we know, arrays are a fundamental part of Java. So in this video, I'm going to be giving you guys seven super useful and helpful methods from the Java arrays class that you can incorporate into your own code. Of course, if you want additional information on any of these methods, you can head over to Oracle's official documentation, which gives you a link to every method. There you can look at an explanation of the method, examples, it shows you the parameters and what the method returns. Of course, the goal of this video is to explain it well enough so you don't have to refer to the docs, but it's good to keep in mind just in case you ever forget what one of these methods does. All right, the first one we're gonna look at is as list. This takes in an array, and it returns it in the form of a list. A list is a data structure from the Java collections class. A list object gives you more functionality and flexibility when dealing with a list of elements than an array does. So as you can see, we have an array here with three elements, chicken, bacon, and avocado. And yes, I was hungry when I wrote this out. So the syntax for this is pretty simple. So here we have arrays, which is the name of the class. Now, all of these methods are static methods, meaning you don't have to create an arrays object to invoke them. You can simply use arrays and then the dot operator and then the name of the method. For as list, we just need to pass in the array. And what this does is it returns this as a list. So let's create a list variable. Now it does have to be the same type of the array that we pass in. And then let's just go ahead and loop through each element. So what this does is it just loops through every element in the list and it prints out that element with a space after it. So as you can see here, we have chicken, bacon, and avocado. Now the reason you'd wanna do this is because a list gives you more functionality and flexibility. When it's an array, you can't remove or add elements. When you have a list, you could do things like, you know, get an element, you can add to an element, you can remove an element. So it just gives you a little bit more functionality. Next, we're gonna look at the fill method. Now there are a few ways to instantiate an array. When you're instantiating it like this, which would create an array of five elements, it sets every element to a default value. For integers, it sets everything to a zero. So if we wanna print that out, so as we can see here, there are five zeros. If these were objects, it would set them all to null. But say for whatever reason, we don't want these to be zero. Say we're playing a game and we have like five users and we all want them to start with 100 points. This is where the fill method comes in play. So again, we'd invoke it calling arrays.fill. We need to pass in the array and then the value that we want to set it to. So we'll do 100. Now we hit run. Now we see everything defaults to 100. The next method we're gonna look at is copy of. This is an easy way to duplicate an existing array. Now you might be like, okay, I have an array here of five elements. Why can't I just set array two equal to array, let's call this array one. What this actually does is it sets array two to point at the same set of numbers as array one. So if you edit one of these, it's gonna edit the other one. So if we do something like array two at element two equals 47, and then we print out array one, element two, we see that these are actually pointing to the same element. So what we do is we call arrays.copy of. Now what array do you want to copy from? We wanna copy from array one. And then the second parameter is the length that you want to copy. For example, if you only wanted to copy a few elements or a range of elements, you could do that. We wanna copy the whole thing, so we're gonna do array one dot length. So just to prove that this created a new copy, let's go ahead and change one of the elements. So here again, I changed element two of array two equal to 47. I print out all the elements of array one. We create a new line and then we print out all the elements of array two. We go ahead and run that. Now we see that only the element of array two got changed. Next, we're gonna look at the equals method. Again, another pitfall you might run into is why can't I just do array one equals array two. Well, these are actually checking if these are pointing to the exact same set of data. But since these are two different arrays, we want to check the contents of each array. That's when the equals method comes into play. So what we could do here is we could simply print out arrays dot equals, and then we pass in our two arrays. And this is going to return a Boolean value of whether or not they're equal. So as we can see here, this is true. If we add a fourth element to the second array, let's just add in apples run that, boom, it's false. So as you've probably noticed, most of the method names are pretty self-explanatory as to what the method does. So there's not really much for me to explain there, but that's a good thing. Next up, we have the compare method, which is one of the ones that isn't as intuitive. 
So this is very similar to the equals method where it compares two arrays and it compares them lexicographically. So the syntax for that is arrays dot compare and it takes in the two methods. Now, if the two elements have the same number of elements and all the elements are equal, it returns a zero. Otherwise, if array one is lexicographically first, it returns a negative number. If array two is lexicographically first, it returns a positive number. So let's save the value that this method returns into a variable and let's print that variable out. So initially, since these are equal and we run it, it's gonna return a zero. But let's, let's say we want array one to be lexicographically first. Uh, well, let's just add a Z in front of lettuce and let's run that. And we see that it runs negative 14. Now, the number itself is the difference. So Z is 14 letters after L, so it's gonna return a negative 14. Let's go ahead and flip that and put the Z in front of lettuce. Let's run that. And then we see that we have a positive 14 here. So why would you wanna use this instead of equals? Well, it just gives you a little bit more information than a true or a false. Say you wanna handle it differently based on which one of these is lexicographically first. So you could do something like if C equals zero, do something else. If C is less than zero, do something, otherwise do something else. So next up we have the sort method. And again, this one's pretty self-explanatory. You call arrays.sort and then you pass in the array that you want to sort. Now let's go ahead and loop through the array and print out the elements. And we see now it is in sorted order. So for primitive types like integers, doubles, Java knows how to sort those already because it's just one field. But say you have an object with multiple fields. Say you have like a student object that has a name, an age, and you call the sort method. It's going to be like, well, how do you want to sort these? Because there has multiple properties. Do you want to sort on the name, the age, etc. So we're not going to talk about it in this video, but there is a second parameter that you can add here called a comparator. And that basically tells the sort method how you wanna sort objects. So again, I'll leave it up to you if you wanna look into comparators. Finally, we have a binary search. This takes in a sorted array and an element, and it returns the index of where that element is. If it can't find it, it'll return a negative one. So let's go ahead and run binary search. It's gonna look like arrays.binary search. We pass in the array, and then we pass in an element that we want it to find. So let's, uh, let's look for 19, and then let's go ahead and print out what this value returns. So we see that 19 is the zero, one, two, three, fourth element. And we see that it prints out a four. Now, for those of you that know how binary search works, you know that it has to be a sorted array. If the array is unsorted, it gives you an undefined result. It might give you the right result, but it's not guaranteed. And it's not the job of the method to ensure that the array is sorted. That's up to the developer. So say we have a list here that's not sorted. So let's just add a hundred here and say we're looking for 100, let's run that, we see that it gives us a negative value. It's gonna be like, you know, like I have no idea where this is. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing is if you have duplicate values, it's not a guarantee which value is gonna be returned. So say we have multiple tens, and we pass in 10 as our key, and we run that, we see that we get a three, which is right. There is a 10 at element three, but let's add a few more tens in here. So I added three more tens and we're still looking for a 10. We run that. We see now it returns a five, which again is correct, but it's not, uh, it's not consistent and it's not guaranteed which one's gonna get returned. Now, a lot of these are probably methods that you could implement on your own, like checking if two arrays are equal, but I encourage you to always use in the built-in methods whenever possible, just because they're a little bit safer, they're more optimized. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Be sure to check out my Java playlist for more Java-related tutorials. I'll link that down in the description. And I'll see you guys in the next one.